So thank you everyone for coming again. Um, today we're here to talk about a cool product from a company called Livable Cities. And the title of today's webinar is Microsensing, an intriguing proposal. And the reason I named it that is because what this company is delivering is, is a very new concept to the traffic industry. Um, the idea of very low cost sensors in very high volume. And it kind of gives you the opportunity to deploy much more uh, sensors than you traditionally would and creates kind of some new ideas and some new concepts around how data might be used uh, in kind of smart cities going forward. So just to outline what the progress of the presentation will go through, we're going to first look at kind of traffic data history, kind of what different technologies were used and what are some of the challenges and progressions in recent years. Um, then we're going to focus in on um, how these sensors are mounted. It's focused around street light mounting and some of the unique advantages of that. But then we'll delve into some of the ideas and interesting business cases around micro sensing and what's possible with these sensors. Then of course, we'll jump into a Q and A. So as we go on the right-hand side in your um, side panel, you do have a question um, tab. So if you can please, as these questions come to mind, please post your questions in there. We won't answer them as time goes uh, by, but. We will um, answer them at the end. It would be great to have a list of them uh, waiting for when we jump into that section. And, and one other reminder is that we will have a quiz at the end, which will involve a giveaway of a nice little bundle of goodies from Stinson ITS. So uh, keep in mind, uh, keep your ears open, and uh, we'll have that right before the questions. So let's jump into it. So today it's myself, Michael McGuire, and Ajay Kaushik presenting. Ajay is our technical sales director, so he's responsible for promoting and selling this product in Ontario. And I get a little involved with some of these new products as well. So him and I are jointly uh, discussing this new business model and this product with some of our customers. So Livable Cities is a fairly new brand, um, so you might not know it, but it is part of a larger company um, called LED Roadway Lighting. Now, this is a Canadian company based in the Halifax area that's been around since about 2007. So these guys are very prominent in the LED, LED luminaire business. We come across them all the time in specs and drawings for projects. So it seems to be that they've had a, a lot of success in the market. And in 2019, they launched their uh, Livable Cities brand. And that's focused all around these sensors that we're talking about today. So again, it's a Canadian made company. And we love representing Canadian brands, and so we're very happy to see another manufacturer uh, pop up in the ITS space. So I'm going to pass it over to Ajay now, and he'll walk through a little bit of the history and kind of how things are evolving over time. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, and as you can see on this slide, I'm going to start with uh, talking about evolution of traffic uh, counting technologies. So traffic counting is not new. It started as early as 1920s with manual counting. Uh, around 1950s, manual counters, uh, you know, mechanical counters came into the market, which assisted in manual counting. And many of these uh, mechanical counters are still in use. Uh, they're more attract now. Um, loop counters were the first automated traffic counting technology. Uh, although they exist since uh, 1930s, they became popular in 1980s. Uh, there's always a small problem with them, which was it is difficult to install and maintain. And uh, that's why pneumatic counters became very popular uh, later. Uh, radar as a technology uh, have been around since the Second World War. But for traffic counting, it, it only uh, came into applications from 1980s. Uh, as radars became smaller, portable, and more affordable, they become very popular in traffic industry. There are both types of radars available, which is uh, uh, doctor radar or FMCW radars, uh, but they're really good for traffic counting, vehicle classification, and speed measurements. Uh, similarly, you know, uh, video cameras, the uh, video-based uh, traffic counting has been there since 1990s, but with better cameras, better algorithms, and better processes, uh, the technology has evolved. Especially in the last 10 years, they have become very, very popular. We have seen a lot of products which have come up recently. Um, again. Uh, LiDAR, uh, I first came to know about LiDAR in 2010, but you know there have been products which are out since 2015 in uh, traffic industry. We don't see too many of them right now, 
but especially with the evolution of 2D LiDARs and 3D LiDARs, I'm sure in the next few years, we'll see a lot of products in the market. Um, so in terms of technology, it's, it's not just the sensing technology, but it's also the evolution of other technologies around these sensors, such as, uh, say, the microcontrollers, the data processing, the 4G, 3G, uh, 4G, 5G networks, the cloud storage and processing, you know, all of this together uh, has made it possible to collect traffic data from multiple sources in the field directly and, you know, get it on a cloud software somewhere and get it accessed from your phones or your devices, you know. So, uh, uh, next, next slide, please, Michael. So if you really think about, you know, all these technologies, uh, traffic data usage has also uh, evolved in the last, you know, so many years, um, especially in these three different categories that I'm showing on this slide. Uh, the first category is long, long range planning. Each one of you is probably very well aware of, about this, but all you really care about is year on year increase in, you know, AADT uh, level of service or collisions because you want to take major decisions based on some of this traffic uh, data. Uh, again, could be about uh, construction of new roads, could be about construction of new lanes. Uh, the second category of data is is something where we find that most bigger municipalities use them a lot now, uh, but this is more recent than the first one, uh, where you know you use this data uh, for road operations. Uh, signals and maintenance groups. Uh, this is more granular than the data that I talked about in the first uh, section, which is the macro data. You know, this is more about every day's data, morning peaks, evening peaks. Uh, it will be nice to know, you know, what's, what's happening on my weekdays, AM and PM peaks, what's happening on Monday mornings, what's happening on Friday evenings, so that you can optimize your systems, you can optimize your operations accordingly, uh, especially during COVID-19. We saw that construction groups and even say large cities, they were taking advantage of such data because now they could uh, say uh, elongate the construction hours or they could do more uh, lane closures based on actual traffic data on different days of the week. So uh, that is being used very well nowadays. Uh, the last category, which is kind of ignored is the traffic data for safety, calming and enforcement. Um, this group usually depends on data collected for the first and second categories here. Uh, usually, they only respond to respond, uh, you know, to complaints from residents. Um, I, I'll give you a very, very good example of this. Um, about a month ago, I was visiting a town in Western Ontario. I won't name them right now; it's not appropriate, but uh, um, they have supplied radar signs to them, and we were supplying more radars to them. So I was visiting them, and they took me to this nice. Uh, one kilometer long uh, residential area where there are a lot of retired people and a lot of kids around. So they said they've been facing speed complaints from last couple of years. Uh, the first thing they did was have a PXO, especially around the uh, community center. They had a lot of complaints. So they put a PXO out there so people can you know easily cross other stop, uh, but there were still more speeding complaints. Uh, so they decided to put two different radar signs, one in each different each direction so that people can see what their speeds are. This is a 40 zone. They put a couple of speed signs as well. And, and it worked very well for the first few months. And then uh, they started getting the complaints again. So, you know, most of you who know me know that I always carry around my radars. So we put a radar out there for a week. We did a traffic study and we found that in a 40, 40 zone, the 85th percentile was 58. And there were regular occurrences of 70s and 80s every hour, plus there were three occurrences of above 100. I'm sure you must have seen all this data, you know, but how do you get data so that you can act on, you know, how do you uh, act on this data to ensure security or safety of that roadway? Because it's at just at one point, even if you, I'll give you another example. Uh, from my house, all the way to office is about 15 minutes drive. There's one automated speed enforcement unit um, everybody on the road knows where they are. And we all slow down just 200 meters before that and get back up to speed 100 meters later. So even if you put uh, speed enforcement, um, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, a unit or let's say a radar sign, people are eventually gonna get used to it and people will know what to do about this. So this is something we feel that this particular product that we're talking about is going to help you in getting this micro data 
I'll let Michael talk about the radar first, and then I'll come back and discuss how this sensor can be used in, for safety and getting your micro data of the roadways. Perfect. Thanks, CJ. Yeah, so asking why streetlights? And as I mentioned at the beginning, it, streetlights have always been around as kind of a talking point as an interesting place to, to mount sensors and devices, but I, I haven't really seen anybody take advantage. I think Livable Cities is the first company to really narrow in and, and provide a full solution focused around sensorizing um, those streetlights. Um, the main factors that kind of make it very advantageous is First, they're everywhere. On almost every, every major road, you have streetlights. Existing infrastructure, they're 30 feet up in the air. They provide you a great view of the roadway. And on top of that, uh, there's this NEMA socket that's on top of pretty much every single luminaire that's been built in the last 30 years. So I'm not sure if you're all familiar with this, but this is a socket that was standardized about 30 years ago. And it's typically used um, to control the light for on-off control between day and night. So there's a photo cell that you will screw into that and it will just control the light, turn it on when it gets dark. And some cities will bypass that with a shorting cap and then control it centrally. But all the lights have this socket and that provides easy AC power to anything that you plug into there. So this is a beautiful combination of an existing mounting height, good perspective on the roadway, and a source of power, let alone the fact that it's up in the air, so you get great signal strength for LT and any other kind of communication that you want to do. There are some potential limitations here. We have seen some cities that will bank the power, meaning they short them all out, and then they control the power centrally, turning on and off a bank of streetlights at the same time, such that there's no power during the day. So that's a potential challenge if you're trying to deploy these sensors. We see less and less cities doing that. Um, but one thing to note with the sensors that we won't get into it today, but this, the core of the system is actually a lighting control module. So if you wanted to switch back to localized control, you can use this system to turn the street light on and off based on a schedule or time of day or, or anything else like that. So you do have that ability, but today we're gonna focus on the sensorization portion of the, the product, which is the radar Doppler sensor in the top of it there. So as I mentioned, this is not just a radar sensor, it's actually a platform. So in the bottom right here, this is the um, kind of the core of this device. And if you see on the top, there's, there's something missing there. And, and you'll notice on these various sensor types, there's a, a cap of different types. And so that's where the sensor goes, but this core module is actually um, providing remote communication. So it has LTE communication built into it, GPS um, power system, obviously to interface with the street light. And then you can click on the various sensors that are available. So in this case, we're, we're looking at these three current ones that are available, but Livable Cities is planning for a, a wide range of sensors. And so you have the ability to change the sensor that's installed over time as well, which is a very cool concept. So the one we're focusing on today is radar um, speed sensor, but they also have an air quality sensor. In this case, it's a particle density uh, sensor, but there is, greenhouse gases, which is an important air quality um, metric as well. And that is coming in the second half of 2021. And then noise detection as well. I see that being very useful in work zones where, you know, time of day, noise complaints and uh, uh, regulation of, of that activity is probably going to be very useful. But I, I find the air quality one especially interesting. Typically, traffic guys are not so interested in air quality and it might not fall into their um, category of concern. But often when we're pitching large projects and we're trying to quantify um, the value of a solution, whether we're trying to reduce congestion or delay at intersections or along corridors, we often quantify it and include the reduction in greenhouse gases based on you know, the less idling of vehicles and the less cars sitting on the road not moving. And we usually just kind of guess at that number. But I can see an interesting um, case where you can deploy these sensors and actually quantify not only have we saved the public, you know, uh, one minute off their travel time, but we've also reduced greenhouse gases on average by say 14% for this corridor. And so I can see a, a combined use of these various sensors for a number of smart city applications. Um, so we're gonna jump into now the, the speed sensor specifically and talk about its various characteristics. So on the right here, there's a diagram showing kind of the 
the beam spread of the radar sensor. And this red area is where it detects the best. So as Ajay mentioned, this is a Doppler-based radar sensor. And so it can measure speed extremely well. However, Doppler does work on motion. So below four kilometers an hour, it cannot read vehicle speeds very well. So it's great for speed measurement. It's not great for counting because when you have congested conditions, you're not gonna be able to nicely count the car. So in a free flow position, I think it could do decent at volume, but we still haven't tested exactly how accurate the counting is. But the, the core use case we see is around speed measurement and profiling, and especially profiling on a wide scale and providing trending information on, on different traffic patterns that you see. So what it can capture is two to three lanes. It sounds like it can do a fourth lane as well, but we'll, we'll, we'll be doing some of our own uh, demo testing in the next month or two, and we can share that with anybody that's interested to see exactly just how accurate it is at both speed and counting. But the most important and kind of disruptive aspect of this product is the business model and the pricing associated with that. So instead of this being a traditional capital expenditure with ongoing costs, et cetera, they've approached this as kind of like a cell phone model where there's no upfront cost for the hardware. All you pay is a monthly fee for a turnkey solution for all this data collection. So it's $50 a month. You have to sign up per device for at least six months, but then you own the equipment you can cancel at any time, pause the subscription, whatever you want to do. Um, but for that $50, right off the bat, you get the sensor, which includes the LTE communication, the SIM card, all that. So the data is out there being collected, being transmitted to the cloud, and the cloud software is included in that as well. So the web-based cloud software is just pulling in the data constantly, and you don't have to worry about anything except logging in to download your data. So it, if you're familiar with, with other data capture solutions or, or uh, automated speed enforcement, the, the massive scale of cost of $40,000, $50,000 per sensor is pretty incredible. And so we see a nice complement between, you know, what, how disruptive kind of a low cost device like this could be such that it, it's, it's kind of a no brainer to do this widespread data collection to try to strategically place your infrastructure um, in, a, in a better way and, and make better use of um, your important budgets. So I'm stealing a little bit of Jay's thunder there, but I'm going to pass it on to him to talk about what we see as the primary use case for this, and that's supporting uh, Vision Zero initiatives. Thanks, Michael. So yeah, you kind of covered that, um, and this is the most important part, especially the Vision Zero uh, people. You know, people who are related to safety and uh, you know speed enforcement on roads. Uh, they are the biggest beneficiaries of something like this. So as I've discussed earlier, you know, uh, given you examples of automated speed enforcement and radar science, they definitely help you reduce speeds. But how do you understand the real impact of the deployment? How long has been the impact? How do you know what is the next best location to put an automated speed enforcement unit? Um, can you help your local police to identify what locations and what times and which times of the day of the week you're going to do speed enforcements, you know, you got to have some data to be able to take certain decisions. And for this, uh, we believe widespread deployments of speed sensors in cities, uh, something which is very cost effective, something which is uh, also vandal proof, you know, 30 feet high, right above the street light, it's pretty vandal proof. We believe livable cities have really found an answer to that with um, an all inclusive price of $1.50 per sensor, you could deploy 40 sensors in $2,000 a month and get speeding patterns across your city. So if you look at this uh, diagram, this is a deployment of system in Halifax. Uh, and you can see that you can have all these deployments in so many different places. And then you can also have this automated speed enforcement or radar signs in different locations. And you can strategically deploy, you know, uh, you know this pricey uh, equipment based on where the speeds are higher, where the speeds are lower. Michael, if you show the next slide, so this is an actual deployment, and you can probably see red, yellow, and green uh, zones here, wherever the sensors were there. But imagine there's still so many other roads remaining. So if you really want micro sensing, imagine having hundreds of these street light sensors around your city. Then you have a very, very good view of the speeds, and you can manage the deployments of your other assets. You can also easily do a before and after study. You may be able to see 
uh, you know, when the uh, speed and how much time the speed radars and other enforcement uh, options become kind of uh, not so useful and you, it's time to move the location, something like that. So we, you know, next slide please, Michael. So this is, this pricing especially has, uh, you know, got us to a point where you may not have to decide between putting this sensor on school zones or you know, community center, cent, uh, community centers or senior, uh, you know, citizen areas. You can now install some of this in industrial areas. For example, what if you want to put some of the speed sensors and some of the pollution sensors in industrial areas, and you can monitor, hey, how's the pollution levels, especially in AM peaks and PM peaks on weekdays. Uh, maybe residential areas, commercial areas, uh, are the speeding high, especially early in the morning, so late in the evenings, are there any other, uh, you know, mob events out there, something like that. So you don't really have to choose because the price is so low, you can actually have a good network, you can increase the network year on year, depending on the budgets. And you, as you know, as you can see, there are other sensors also, you might be able to get the funding from other programs within the city. So we feel this is really, really good data. And especially for uh, patient zero people, this would be game changing. I'll now pass it on to Michael to discuss the software. Perfect, thanks Jake. So as I mentioned, it's a turnkey solution. And so what we're showing you here is um, the, so the, the cloud software platform. They call it SmartLinks. And so it's cloud-based web access to any device, whether it be your smartphone, tablet, or computer, as long as you have, have a browser, you can access this. And, and this is not new software. Um, this is actually the software that's used by their um, streetlight control system. So it's been around for 10 or 15 years. And so I was, I was very impressed when I saw it. And once I realized it's actually quite, you know, old and well-developed software, that, that makes a lot more sense. But it's, it's got a lot of the core functionality you look for in, in central software, whether it be, you know, monitoring, alerting, uh, reporting, uh, map-based views. and, and the coolest thing that I liked was actually the dashboarding. And that's what you see here in this screenshot. That's actually a screenshot of a, of a dashboard. And you see these tiles, you can move them around and put a ton of different data sets into those. And so uh, often I find dashboarding is one of the most limited functions in uh, central softwares. And this one has a ton of customization so you can get all the KPIs you want, as well as a map based view and maybe a few key charts all right at your fingertips. And so. I really like the software and of course, you know, for you bigger cities, if you have central software, nobody wants to learn a new platform. Um, so it does have a very extensive API. So you can get all the data that's generated by the system and integrate it into your existing platform, no problem at all. So as I mentioned, we have reporting, but there's also automatic reporting. So even if not, you're not using the platform day to day for um, your workflows, you can still set up automated email um, reports such as this. We often do this where we'll set up a, a one week period or a one month period where we wanna know, you know, what was the highest offending 85th percentile areas in my city or, you know, how many above 100 kilometer speeds like that 40 zone that Ajay was talking about. So we can set up automated reports with custom periods, custom areas if there's certain managers that are responsible for certain regions and just have it sitting in your email in the morning so that you can see were there any significant events that happened in the past week or the past couple of days? And uh, yeah, actually I'll pass it back to Ajay to talk about our testing that's ongoing right now. Yeah, we are uh, in the process of testing these sensors uh, with three different cities and that's in line with every single product, new product that we try out here at Cincinnati yes, We test every single feature, the installation, the commissioning, the dashboarding, the reports, even sometimes API integration with our customers, even before we start selling it. So, uh, you know, if you are interested in a demo of uh, the, of the sensor, please let me know. Uh, that's my email ID right there. Um, send me an email, I'll, I'll be in touch with you. I'll help you not just through the installation and commissioning, but also through dashboarding, reporting, the whole process in your whole evaluation. And in six months time or three months time, depending on what you choose, uh, we will take the sensors back. So. Yeah, that's it. All right, Jay, you take care of the quids here. Oh, okay, great. So, yeah, that's the question. And this is what you're going to win a cup, a stencil diary, and a pen. 
so the question for this um, uh, this webinar is what transport concept or policy does the radar sensor best support? We talked about this and these are the options. Please so put guys, it up. let's say show them up there. Please put it in the chat in the right hand side and the first one to get the correct answer will, will win the prize. So I'm just gonna click it now and get ready in your chat. <laughs> so it's A, complete streets, B, multimodal inclusion, C, vision zero, D, smart city calming. I'll go to the next page for Sam to uh, look up who won. So we already have a winner. Um, Carl, you won. I will email you afterwards to get your address so we can ship out your prize. Perfect. Congratulations, Carl. That's great. I know it wasn't the most complicated question. We struggled to find a good one for, uh, for this webinar. But uh, now we're switching on to questions. So if there's any questions, I see a few in there. If you can uh, post them in the sidebar there, uh, we'd be happy to answer them. If Sam, you want to read out that first one? Yep. Someone wants to know how many pins are needed, five or seven? Yeah, so either or. Uh, we can work on the newer system or the older system uh, for rotate, uh, for putting these NEMA sockets in there. There's also a newer standard with more pins than that for additional dimming control, and we can we can interface with, with any of those. Other than LTE, what other protocols are supported? Laura Wan, question mark. No, no, no other protocols, uh, just LTE. Um, so we, uh, we've, we've been involved with Laura before. Um, it's a bit of a challenge because you have to do everything yourself, but the, all the major providers have really adopted the LTE M standard. So we, because it offers such cheap network fees as well as such great coverage, um, there, there's no value, at least so far, that we can see in trying to adopt other um, uh, wireless solutions. So right now it's just LTE M1 network. That's the only one that's supported. But we do have coverage across Canada. Anywhere you have cell service, you would have LTE M1 coverage. For speed applications, does it pick up all vehicles, for example, bicycles, e-bikes, et cetera? So as far as we know, um, it does pick up some bikes, but we haven't done extensive testing on the accuracy and how often it picks up bikes. So um, we'll certainly um, uh, take your name down and send you a follow-up once we've done testing. Our understanding is it does collect data on bikes, but we don't know how robust it is. It will also collect on pedestrians, but we haven't deployed it in those environments just yet. So we know it works really good on vehicles, but we'll have to get back to you on just how good it works on bikes. But it, it's stated that it does, and we'll, we'll be doing some testing on that in the next month or two. Someone wants to know, um, the value of $50 is valued for which countries? Do you have an option on selling these on a supply installed test and commission basis? So yes, we do. That's Canadian dollars that we're talking about. Sorry, I forgot that we might have some US uh, customers here. Um, we do have the ability to supply and install and commission. So we will always be on site to help commission these uh, unless we've sent them very far away. Um, up north or something like that, but we certainly can be on site. And certainly for the demos that we're launching, we're providing the option to install commission and make it a completely cost neutral endeavor for cities so that they can try it out very easily. But uh, as far as Stinson ITS as a company, we offer full turnkey solutions regularly with very long maintenance periods. So that's certainly no stranger to us. Does this device provide enforcement for speed, possibilities of having a camera to take the picture of the offending vehicle? Sorry, Dan, I'm taking all these. Why don't you take this one? <laughs> oh, well, this particular device um, cannot really take pictures, uh, but I know that something with a camera is in development, uh, and probably early next year they'll come out with this, but for now, uh, now we don't have that capability. Can yeah, the sensors be integrated into other platforms? Uh, Michael, did you want to add something there? I'm just saying no, just speed statistics. It's not, it's certainly not an enforcement device and, and you would need a license plate photos and all that. So it's it's never going to get to that level in, of enforcement. This is purely micro sensing of general trend data, not something sophisticated for enforcement. That's going to take the, the heavy duty. The, that's the reason why automated speed enforcement is so 
expensive is because it has to stand up in court, be 99.999% accurate. And so these devices are not meant to, to tackle that kind of market and that kind of accuracy requirements. Yeah, we offer some other solutions for this with LPR cameras and you know, uh, I'll send you an email about this later. Uh, can the sensors be integrated into other platforms? Certainly. This, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Jay. Yeah, absolutely. So full API support is available and uh, they can be integrated using APIs. Uh, any help is required about that. If you want to check with me, uh, I'll be able to help you on that. In regards to the installation of the units, would the implementation be up to the municipality to arrange? Sorry, I'll click this one. So it, it can go either way. Um, the installation is extremely easy. Um, the hardest part is getting access to the, the street luminaire. So you might have to close a lane or do a short term closure to get up to it. But once you've got a bucket truck, you're up to the um, luminaire. It's a matter of five minutes to screw the device in, rotate the radar in the right direction to be looking up or downstream. And then you're off to the races. You can do everything else remotely, it kind of self configures. But uh, we can assist, we can do it ourselves as part of the demo. We, we've offered to do it. Um, but some customers have their own crews and want to uh, take that on, but we're, we're open to either one. But either way, we can be on site to make sure that it goes smoothly and ensure that we can see the device and we're collecting data before we uh, take off. What is the life expectancy of these units? That's a good question. I believe the MTBF was around nine years, but um, I don't, don't quote me on that. That's, uh, that's something I haven't... Uh, I haven't seen yet, so we will get back to you on that. But I imagine it's like most electronics, seven to 12 years, somewhere in there. I know, oh, sorry, one thing I should mention is for the air quality sensor, there is a um, uh, an expendable piece in there. It can only detect those particles for so long. And once every year or so, there's a, a, a component in there, a filter that needs to be uh, replaced. So for the radar sensor, it should have a reasonably long um, lifespan. But for the air quality, there is going to be a replaceable piece that has to be uh, uh, serviced uh, once to uh, twice, a, uh, sorry, every one year or every two years, based on how, how your particulate density, um, it will get clogged up and you'll get a notification saying that it's not, uh, that it's full and it needs to be replaced. So that's one consumable in that product. And um, Ryan has requested if that Ajay sent him information regarding ASC afterwards. So we saw that. Sure. Do the sensors have an internal GPS? Yes. Yes, each one of these sensors has an internal GPS and you don't need to configure anything in the field. Just, you know, rotate uh, the device, aim it, and then leave it. The software automatically takes care of the exact location because it has the GPS location of that unit. Are the sensors working on one lane per direction street? Yes, so it, it can do bi-directional. It, it can't tell you the difference between the lanes. Like it can't do lane by lane definition. It will aggregate the, the lanes and measure up to three lanes total, regardless if they're going one direction or the other. Can you move the device around regularly? I don't, you certainly can. I know um, we asked the same question. We were told preferably not. So there's probably going to be a balance in commissioning because the device is meant to auto configure and then stay in that location forever. Um, but we do have the ability to manually reconfigure the device at a new location. So it's possible, but not the intended use of the, the device. So if it was for like longer stretches, maybe a few months at one location, a few months at the other, I think that would be fine. But if you're thinking to move it on a daily or weekly basis, that's going to be, uh, that's not what they've considered or anticipated. But there's always the potential if there's an appetite for that. We, we could discuss it, but it's not intended to be moved. And that looks like the end of the question. Beautiful. Well, lots of questions. Thank you so much, everyone. That, uh, that's great to see. So we do have, um, I just want to announce our next webinar topic is. Um, it's all about radar signs, funny enough. So another radar product. Um, so you guys are all very familiar with radar feedback signs. And we've been representing radar signs for about six years now. And um, a big step forward that's happened recently is they've launched their cloud platform, similar to these other software 
um, uh, offerings from the likes of livable cities. The cloud really steps um, step things up to the next level. Like it allows you to, like data collection is always available locally, but nobody drives out to actually collect this data via Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, you name it, or plugging in. But by offering LTE built in, we're seeing a ton of more traction in the industry to automate that data collection, get it all in one portal automatically. And we've been very impressed with Rate of Science New Cloud. And so Brian and Michael will be talking about that next month. So I hope you'll join us uh, on May 5th. Again, same time, one o'clock to 1.45. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you there. So that's it for us. Um, here's our contact information. We'll also include it in the email as well as a recording that goes out tomorrow. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Hope to see you on the thank next everyone. one. I did just see that someone asked if we're sending out the um, slides. We will be sending out the slides and a copy of the webinar. And everyone who requested information will contact afterwards by email. Absolutely. And if there's any follow up questions, feel free to email us, uh, Jay or myself, and we'd be happy to respond back. Sure. Thanks very much, everyone. Go Thank on. you, everyone. Bye.